Hey, I'm so glad you guys are joining us. Uh, it's good to see your faces. You guys excited to be here tonight? Hey, and I just want to say welcome for those of you guys who are watching at Church at Home. Uh, we love that you're gathering with us week after week. Uh, I want to read a psalm for you. And uh, this has become uh, my favorite psalm in this season. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you can feel free to turn there. This is Psalm 46. This is what it says. God is our refuge and strength. An ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. And God is with her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress you guys this is why we gather as a church either physically or online we gather to remember in a world that feels like it is falling into the heart of the sea that god is our fortress he is our rock and so as we're here gathered in this place, sitting under the word, worshiping together. We're doing it to remind ourselves of who God is in the midst of a season like this. And who is he? He's our rock. And when we hold to him, we do not move or shake or quake because he's the one who carries us through this season. So grab your Bibles and go ahead and turn to the book of John as we continue in week two of our series, Come Together. Between politics and a pandemic, it feels like the world is being torn apart. A hurricane of hurt sweeps the streets, communities, and culture. But what if hope and healing flooded in? What if renewal rushed through our neighborhoods? What if the light gained ground and darkness was undone? as our cities were saturated with the gospel. Instead of hot tempers, humility. Instead of division, desperation. Instead of politics, peace. What if, on the backdrop of a divided world, a united church should rise? And around Jesus, countless hearts come together. ...to be together under the word of God today. Come on. I need your help today. Like, I need your help agreeing with the power and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus in the Word of God. And we are together. And so, let's try that again. Are you guys excited to study God's Word? Man, last service let me down, and I don't believe that the uh, second service, whatever time it is right now, will do that. I think we're going to enjoy God's word because this is a unique and beautiful setting. Don't tell the first service that I said that, but here's the reality. We are the church of Jesus Christ, triumphant over sin, death, the grave, and so we're going to be excited about that. We are on the winning team. And how many of you guys actually have played sports or are you going to be down with the sport metaphors tonight? We're going to use some of those. Okay. You guys, you guys played sports? Jake, no? No sports? Yeah, so, you know, Art wasn't really that cool of a team. But, but how, many, how many of you guys have like, like you want to be on a winning, winning team? Man, I, I want to be on a So if we were to define like what does a winning team, what like elements or ingredients does a winning team have? Uh, we might think of some things, right? The first one might be like, man, a winning team has some star 
players. Right, like we have some start, we have a Michael Jordan on our team. A winning team would have things like a, a, an excellent coach, right? Somebody who's going to really inspire the team. And things like, um, you know, a, an intense training program. And so those would all be true, and I think those things uh, are true. But um, there's one key missing ingredient to that formula. And, and it's actually the ingredient that they found in uh, Remember the Titans, Anyways, remember that movie? Come on, it was such a great movie. That would be like a really great movie for today, amen? Like that's a movie that we should get behind. So remember the Titans, Denzel Washington, awesome film, watching it recently. And the story is basically, it's the 1970s and they are integrating like they did uh, two schools, a black school and a white school. And because of that, the football program uh, was basically shaken up, right? So they have a brand new coach and because he's black, everybody's racist against him. They don't want the coach there. Um, there's new players on the team, and because of that, the team itself is shuffled around. And p perhaps most insurmountable of all these problems, there is uh, just absolute racial tension taking place between the boys on the team. And so they're a team divided. And the coach um, basically comes up with this strategy. He's like, look, we, we, he could do all the intense training. He could do all that, and he would do all that. But here's the reality. His strategy was unity. He said, I'm going to bring these boys together. And so he took them to Gettysburg and he wore them out and he put them all in the same room so they would have to deal with one another. And by the end of this training program, they had achieved this kind of racial reconciliation, this beautiful unity on the team. So much so that they went on to be undefeated. 13-0, and they took the state championship. And you want to say, yeah, at the end of that movie, you're like, that's awesome. I want to be part of a team like that. Well, listen to me. Like we as the church of Jesus Christ, we are on a winning team. We are on a team like that. And we have a mission like they did. Their mission to win the state title, man, we are on a mission to saturate our city with the gospel. And we want to win at this. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we have a few of the key ingredients already, like all Christians have throughout history. We have, you know, an excellent coach. Who's that as the church? God the Father, yeah. We have a star player. Who's that? Jesus. Come on. Jesus Christ is no better star player than that. And we have a, a rigorous training program called discipleship. But here's what hangs in the balance. That every generation of the church has to reclaim. The, this is what hangs in the balance that determines whether we are going to be a, a church that is torn apart by Satan and rendered ineffective or be a church triumphant that advances the gospel of Jesus Christ into our day and age. And it's unity. That is the determining factor. And so here's what Jesus does in John chapter 17. As he is like our great coach. And he comes out with the whiteboard and does the chalk talk, you know. And he's like, man, I want you to take away this if you take away nothing else. We, this is our winning strategy. It's unity. Unity. And as we continue in our series, Come Together, this is what I want you to take away, is that the strategy, or excuse me, unity is heaven's strategy. Unity is heaven's strategy. And so would you guys stand with me? Stand up. We're going to read God's word, John chapter 17, and give honor to Jesus as we do. And we're just going to make it through two verses today, family. Uh, I, I believe in preaching lots of verses of the scriptures. Last night I preached an entire chapter with the youth. But there are some passages that you just need to slow roast in. You just need it. And so John 17 is one of those. We are literally going to crawl through two verses. And here they are. Verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus, this is your word. Father, we pray that right now the unity that you achieved on the cross would be ours in Christ Jesus. God, that we would be your church that recognizes heaven's strategy is unity. That we would be your church triumphant 
as we seek to saturate our city with the gospel. God, we thank you for a series like this, a time to reflect on not what the world is saying about unity, because the world knows nothing of it, but to see the precious word of Jesus elevate the gospel of Jesus and transform the people of Jesus so that we can witness to Jesus everywhere we go. And it is for his glory that we now study your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. You guys can go ahead and sit down or you can stand forever. That's cool too. So we're going to look at verse 20. And what we actually find in this passage, and the first thing I want you to see is the prayer. This is Jesus' prayer. Um, And what's really significant about verse 20 um, to me is not just uh, that he's praying or even uh, yet what he's praying for. But the first thing I want us to look at is who he is praying for. In verse 20, we find the who he is praying for. Um, And just to give you some context, for about 19 verses in this chapter, Jesus has been praying for the disciples who are all around him, okay? The men who are literally there with him in that room. And then he makes a shift in this verse. It's very significant. Uh, And what he says is, I do not ask for these only, but also for who? Who? Those who will believe in me through their word. And so as we kind of exegete this um, verse, you kind of need to understand this. Uh, Who is Jesus praying for? Well, he says, uh, these only, which which is in reference to the men in the room. And not just for them only, but those who will believe in their word. So we have these only the disciples. And then who is it that he's referring to when he says those who will believe through their word? Yeah, I know Todd's going to help me out today. It's us. We, like, and pause on this for a moment. Sometimes we just blaze through dozens of verses. No, pause on this. What we're reading here is that Jesus prayed for you, Constantine, Sherry, Jesse. Jesus prayed for you, like for me. The eternal son of God is here, and in his human uh, Self, he, he may not have been referencing us, but in the divine nature of Jesus, he could without doubt know exactly who you are seated here tonight. Know exactly what you're going through. Know exactly who your enemies are. Know exactly what your loves are and who, who you're passionate about and who you're for. And listen, he is praying that unity then for you. I don't know if you even get the weight of this. Like this makes me giddy in the gospel, all right? Like I'm excited because here's the beautiful thing that this Jesus, he is like, he's praying for, it's like Jesus. And so I don't know if you've been prayed for by like a prayer warrior. Like, come on, anybody been prayed for by a prayer warrior? Some of you guys came from a charismatic background, I know. And when you were at that church, they had the old lady, the old guy who was just like in the third heaven with God and he was praying for you. Uh, My grandma was a prayer warrior like that. She was, and my older brother and I used to joke about this, like she was literally the, the woman who feared God more than anybody we had ever met, right? And she was praying for her grandkids and there was something special when she did, right? Like she was literally going into a trance and it was just ma like going into this trance she start praying in a tongue and we'd be like okay like something serious is going down right when ma starts praying for something and so my brother would be like when ma starts praying for something you better believe it's going to happen because she has a direct line with jesus like she has him on speed dial she's texting jesus and jesus is like i got you i got you right because he she knows him and and here's the reality there is no prayer warrior who is closer to the father than jesus christ on the planet earth right right? Like Jesus is the ultimate prayer warrior. And and here's Jesus praying for you. And here's how he prays for you. Uh, This word for ask isn't just like, uh, it can be translated to question or to ask somebody something. But when it's in the context of prayer, it is most often translated things like to request, to entreat, to beg. Like he's begging for this to beseech if you read the you know the new king's james or whatever right like like these are the kinds of words he is beseeching the father about something for you and so what is he beseeching the father for you what is jesus praying for that you and i would have well we find out in verse 21 that he says that they may all be one What is he praying for? Unity. Sit in that. Jesus could have prayed for anything. 
But heaven's strategy for the church to move forward is unity. And I love that. So that's the prayer of Jesus. But you know what? Here's the thing about his prayer for unity. There's also kind of like a problem when we think of unity, isn't there? There's kind of a problem. And we're going to see this as um, we kind of pull back and look at the context. But um, really to make it applicable today, the problem when we hear a sermon on unity is the fact that um, when we look at Twitter right now, you know, watch YouTube videos or the nightly news, CNN or Fox, right? We watch that stuff. Do you guys see a bunch of unity out there? No. You see people just singing kumbaya with acoustic guitars and like getting matching tattoos, skipping around, right? That is not what's going on. There is no unity. In fact, um, what we see, and this might get a little uncomfortable, but like we need to preach about real things, don't we? Because what's going on is there is um, kind of an intense divide between the left and between the right in the United States of America in particular. And there's this massive divide. And what is the divide between is ideologies, truth claims, visions for the world, um, world views. And so uh, right now what um, is taking place is really uh, as people become re less religious, they're not therefore becoming ideological less. They might be abandoning spiritual worldviews like Christianity, but they certainly are at heart, by, because we're in the image of God, uh, we are hardwired for ideology. And so people are embracing these secular ideologies in a religious sort of way. And so you see on the left, they're basically presenting a worldview. And you see on the right the same thing. And so the left says, hey, here's the problem with the world. Here's kind of the narrative. The problem is things like injustice. The problem is things like systemic racism. The problem is ignorance to the plight of minorities and people who are marginalized or have suffered. Like, don't you see these problems over here? And then on the right, there's vast, there's a vastly different vision, is there not? Anybody feel really weird right now? On the right, there's a, the, 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 basically the define the problem this way, it's Marxism. Right? It's all of these Marxists tearing the world apart and burning it to the ground and these institutions that really matter. It's the media. right? It's CNN. They're lying about everything. There's no real journalism and truth is abandoned. It's all postmodern. And it's things like ignorance. But it's not ignorance about the plight of minority. What's, what's the ignorance? It's, well, they don't understand history. They don't understand the, the value of the American experiment and we're not in communism and, or, or we're not fascist. Like, this is special and you're destroying it. And all of us in this room feel weird because you buy into some of that stuff, right? I buy in, into some of this, whether it's both or one or the other. We all have a way we see the problem in the world. And um, most of all those things, I mean, really are, are real. Are these not real problems? Oh, yeah. These are real pro injustice, systems of injustice. Anywhere we see that, Marxism, the media, like that is a problem, right? Those are problems, but here's the reality with these worldviews that are simply secular and built around politics rather than the gospel. Is they, um, they identify fruit problems, but they don't actually get at the root problem. Because there's a root problem, and, and we see it here um, in the context of John 17. If you, John 17 is a very famous passage where Jesus prays his high priestly prayer for the disciples and for you and me. But if we were to kind of zoom out, and, and I were your professor here at Multnomah University, and we were kind of studying the book of John, we would pull back and kind of zoom out and look at John 17 all the way to John 20 and see this prayer in the context of where it fits in the story of Jesus. And do you know what's going to happen right after Jesus prays here? It's okay to talk, like, be, who said it? Dan, theologian Dan. He's getting betrayed. He's getting betrayed in just a few verses from now. And what's fascinating is he is praying for the very disciples who are about to persecute him, who are about to disavow and abandon him. Um, the, the context here is that the disciples betray Jesus and so in this betrayal, we actually see that, we actually see ourselves. We see the ultimate problem underneath the service, the very root problem that should, we need to build um, 
our understanding of the world out of. You see, the ultimate problem is not these things that politics deals with. The ultimate problem, this is the reality, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. It's our sin against Jesus on an individual level. And here's the reality with the sin against Jesus that you and I commit every day and are born into. It's this reality that when, when politics is the problem, then my enemy is over there. But when sin is the problem, the enemy is within me. And I actually have to be dealt with by Jesus. And so what secularism is doing with politics and, and the thing that is dividing everyone um, in these ideologies is it's basically pursuing the kingdom without the king. I mean, this is what's going on. We are going to try to establish what everyone wants deep down. We all want a beautiful society, don't we? We want the kingdom of God. It's what we were made for. We want peace. We want harmony. We want justice and equality. And we want, um, we want a healthy economy even. All of these things are good and beautiful. But when we try to strive after those things without the foundation of Christ, we are pursuing the kingdom without the king. And every time we see videos of violence and stuff, we need to say, man, that's pursuing the kingdom without the king. Because here's what, um, here's what secularism is lacking. That you can't solve a spiritual problem with secular solutions. Because in that framework where there is no God, the only way that you can achieve the kind of unity, the kind of kingdom that you want is by conquering your ideological enemies. It's the only way. You're a conservative, shame on you. You're a liberal, you fool. And it's funny, because this is all over the place, but it's serious because this is what people believe. You achieve a unified kingdom by conquering your enemies. That's all the world knows. But in the gospel, what Jesus here is doing by praying for his betraying disciples is demonstrating that gospel unity is what we need. Because in gospel unity, instead of uh, achieving a unified kingdom by conquering our enemies, we achieve a unified kingdom by loving our enemies. And the power of gospel unity is what we need. Look, we don't need hashtag movements. We don't need a president. We don't need, you know, political upheaval. What we need is a bloody cross and an empty grave. That's the only, we need a revival that begins with personal revival. Where I am changed and drawn to the Savior because I'm in sin, bro. Like, I'm desperate for him. And when I recognize that I am the worst sinner that I know, then all of a sudden I get drawn into the most beautiful reality because Jesus himself is there bloody and broken for me on that cross. And it is there that I find healing. It is out of that healing I can then say, man, if I sinned against the Jesus of heaven and he died for me and I know my sin against him in heart and in action and in deed, man, I know my sin against him. What can my ideological enemy do against me that I can't forgive? That's the kind of gospel unity. The gospel unity is powerful in a way that worldly, secular, political ideology is not because only gospel unity has the power to unite the protester and the police officer. It's gospel unity that we need. And so both the left and the right need to bow the knee before King Jesus. And this is why, actually, I believe so much in the word of God. It's not, man, I need to read this article and that. Uh, learning is good and I'm not against politics. I think they matter, but they are not the ultimate thing. It's the scriptures, you guys. A generation that loves, that's what Jesus says, actually. <laughs> Let's uh, look again at verse 21. And what we see is that unity, this unity we want, is rooted in theology. Unity is rooted in theology. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this stuff down. Verse 21 that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And so here Jesus kind of pulls back the veil and tells us where unity is ultimately found. Is unity found in uh, perfect ideological agreement? 
Is unity found in conquering our enemies? Is unity found in uh, more hashtags? No, what unity is found in is the knowledge of who God is. That's where it all starts. Everything originates from God. And so it's not just like nerd Nolan who's like stoked on theology and like reading like this professor from this seminary. Like that's, no, we need a culture of people who care about who God is found in the word of God. Like consider that Jesus himself is saying this comes from like as the father and I are one. That's where it comes from. This this powerful thing. I think we don't even realize how mind-blowing this is. That he and the Father were one, and that he wants us to have that same kind of... What he's saying is, for eternity past, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, distinct persons, existed in loving, worshipful uh, relationship as one being, the ultimate unity. In relationship. And that, that beautiful dance that was going on for all eternity past, he's now saying, I want that for you. Like, I want that between the Greys and the Leontenskews. I want that between the Rays and the Clarks. Like, that's what I want, Jesus is saying. You to experience what we've experienced. It's theological in nature. Are you guys tracking with this? And so, um, and I'm not saying that you should go to like Western seminary and that's where you like learn about God and so now you're a nerd, you know, and because of that, like that may be how some of you are wired and that's awesome and I love that. But, but what I mean is that we would just be people who are thirsty for the word, like day in and day out, that at six in the morning, before you head off to the construction site, it's man, in the beginning was God. This is a theologian. It's rooted in theology. Because here's the beautiful thing. When we are in agreement about who God is and what the scriptures teach, that's the renewing of the mind that can actually root us and ground us with one another in a way that nothing else can. In fact, is our unity in this church, can it be built on that we just see each other all the time? Super not able to do that, right? Like, not an option, actually. Like, they will send, like, the government after you if that... If you're like hanging out right now, right? In more than 25 and without masks. Like that's, but like if if what unites us is ultimately a faith in Jesus founded in the word, that's something that no government, no individual, no movement of Satan can ever take away. I have this, uh, well, new job really. um, And it's that I've become a landscaper. Um, Like somebody's laughing because like, He knows. He's looking like scrawny city boy. You know books, not landscaping, right? I see you, Constantine. But about a landscaper, um, not for pay or anything. You know, Jason didn't fire me yet. It's that uh, my wife has hired me out for free. And so uh, she's like, you need to get out there. You dig up these rhododendron bushes. I hate them. I'm like, why? Like, they only, like, bloom for two weeks. Dig them up. So I'm like, okay, I've never done this before, like, three hours later. And uh, I'm, like, pulling these things out, and I, like, feel like a man, right? Just, like, I pulled, like, a thing from the ground, right? And then I do the second one, and I'm like, what's up? Who's next, right? And she's like, oh, there's another one out in the front yard. That's what's next. I was like, okay. I was already tired, and I was just flexing a little bit. But then I go out there, and I'm like, I got those two. What are you going to do, right? Rhododendron bush. So I start digging, and I start pulling, and this thing was, like, not like the other two at all. Like, I thought those were hard, but this one was, like, an evolutionary mutation, okay? Like, it's, like, thick, and I'm, like, what the heck? I literally, I'm not even joking about this. I got power tools involved. I'm trying to saw this thing with the wrong saws, and neighbors are, like, this kid. And I'm, just, I'm like, ah. I can't, I'm, by the end of it, I'm literally, like, I am not leaving till this is out of the ground. So it's like a weeknight. It's 12 at night, and I'm out there like, <laughs> pull, I pull it out finally. And I'm like, yeah. My wife's like, you're waking up the neighborhood. I'm like, what's up? And I look at my hand because I feel this throbbing, you know. And there's like a giant boil that had bursted. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, oh. This is the most painful thing I've ever gone through as a city boy. I'm like, dude. This was an extremely hard rhododendron to pull out of the ground. And uh, why do I torture you with that disgusting story? Because um, 
The reason why that rhododendron was so hard to pull out of the ground was not because it was an evolutionary mutation, but that it was deeply rooted. That thing was not coming apart. And listen to me, Rice City Church, can we be a church that is so deeply rooted in the word of God, so passionate about this word, that the affiliation and the commitment and the deep desire that we share for this God of this word is what permanently unites us together. Unity is uh, rooted in theology. And I'll just tell you this, that for months and months, my uh, boys and I, we actually, we uh, pray the same prayer every night. I'm super boring by nature. Um, and uh, I just like, we just pray the same thing. We're not gonna pray all this different stuff. I'm not that creative. Let's just go in. And so uh, like literally it's, it's uh, Jesus, thank you for your grace. Make us men of God, strong and brave, tough and tender, who pursue, provide, protect. We pray for our future wives and pre priest future husband, right? And then we, Lord, we pray that our children would be Christians for a thousand generations. I mean, this, it, it's a rope. And um, it's the same. And for months and months, you know what the very last line of that prayer is? Every single night we pray it. We pray it for you. We pray, Lord, we pray for our church, rise, that they would grow spiritually. Because I believe with all of my heart that if we are a deeply rooted church, we will be a church that's united in Christ. And what's beautiful about what Jesus does here is he says it's not just rooted in, it is rooted in theology, but unity actually um, grows up on mission. All this plant metaphor going, right? It's rooted in theology, but unity is grown on mission. Look again at verse 20. This is kind of cool and a different angle to look at this. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And what he's saying here is kind of interesting if you really like think about it. He is saying that there are going to be believers generations and thousands of years from now who believe because the previous generation decided uh, we know who Jesus is and we're going to communicate Jesus and disciple them. I mean, we're gonna share the gospel to a generation that doesn't know him. We're gonna share the gospel with our neighbors who don't know him and we're gonna pray for them and we're gonna disciple them into the likeness of Jesus. And so more disciples are made by disciples who make disciples. Like that's how this works. And, and like think about it because God actually had some options in how he accomplished mission, right? Like it was an option for God. Like he didn't have to use you and me. He had the option of just literally like, here's Will Ray walking down the street. He's like, Jesus sat, boom, like, saved and Jesus like or excuse me Will's like oh I believe in Jesus all of a sudden nobody told me but now I believe in Jesus how do I get plugged in right Take, you know signs up for first step in the whole thing Jesus could have just zapped you for, and maybe he did and that'd be cool or whatever but like he chose not to work independent of other disciples but dependent through other disciples by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life isn't that cool and so here's the reality. Through mission, God inextricably weaves our stories together. And in the same way, anyone who gets saved through you is inextricably woven to you. This is what I'm saying, that because God designed the story such that other people would reach you, that is how he chooses to bind us together. Isn't that cool? Um, this is my story. Like, I got rat pretty radically saved in high school, uh, wasn't following Jesus, heard the gospel of Jesus through some followers of Jesus, and as a result, I'm starting to follow him, and, and then I'm, I'm like, I literally have to share the gospel. Like, I didn't know there was God, and now there's God. So, like, all my buddies, they need to get saved. And so I'm like, taking home, boy, like, you need to know Jesus. You're like, okay, where is he? And so I take him to youth group. He gets saved. We baptize him. Boom. I'm like, all right, now we're on mission. And so then we reach our next buddy, and this becomes this, like, baptism chain. We're one after the other. We had a mini revival. And um, the result of this was these like, you know, seven whatever guys, we were like the, the squad, right? Like we were the crew and we were like bound to one another. And there were certainly problems between the group and there were some of us that naturally were enemies of one another, but now we're bound together by Christ. And what's interesting about that is like you're bound together because it's kind of like I can't get away from you now. It's like this guy like actually smells bad pretty often, Right, like he actually physically stinks, bro. And, but like, I can't get rid of homeboy because he introduced me to Jesus. 
Like, I'm not leaving anywhere because the dude, he, like, led me to the Lord. And he, like, taught me how to read the scriptures and, like, principles of interpretation. Like, he's my dude. I guess I have to tell him to, like, put on deodorant. But we're not leaving, right? This is how it works just this week. It's, it works like this still now. Just this week, I'm in city group and I'm talking to everybody. How you guys doing? You know, and afterwards, the guy, the guy comes up to me. It's this guy who's been a basically non-Christian for months and months, but hanging out and loves the group and everything. And he says, look, dude, against my will this weekend, like I'm pretty sure now I'm a follower of Jesus. <laughs> He's like, I still have all the same questions, but like, I love Jesus now. I was like, what? That's awesome, you know? He's like, I just thought I should tell you. I'm like, of course you should tell me. I'm inextricably woven to this guy. I'm like, dude, like we, we have to baptize this guy, right? He's ours now, right? They can't, they close down Sunday services, but they can't close down the river. We baptize this guy, to, not just to say you believe in Jesus, but to say you're part of the church. You're a brother in the Lord. And so, yeah, we're going to the Sandy River. This is my guy. And this is what's beautiful. Churches that continue to be unified are the churches that are unified on mission with Jesus. And churches that start to like kind of lose focus on that and like start to care about all the other random things that churches can care about, those are the churches that end up divided and having their doors closed. And this is the principle. Inward focused churches fall apart, but outward pushing churches pull together because you have to. I'm going to reach this lost world. Man, I need you, Dave. I'm ruined without you, bro. They hate me out there. And they hate you too. But man, we can pull together and advance the gospel of Jesus. Because <laughs> we're weird, but God's good. And we are in this together. And the converse is true too. And we'll kind of close out with this. That yes, unity has grown as we're out there on mission. But unity itself also advances the mission. See, it works the other way around. Look at verse 21 again. We're just zooming in and turning this passage every which way. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world, say again, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I listen to all the like pastor gurus and like pastors of large churches and really healthy churches and these guys that are really smart. And one of my favorite ones, he says this phrase and I'll never forget it. He's like, listen, he says that um, when you do something that no one is doing, you can begin to reach people that no one is reaching, right? And everyone's like, let's get creative for the Lord. We're gonna start some crazy outreach and this is where bus ministries come from and like now we're using the internet and next thing you know, it's like all this stuff. And I think that's all true. But then you kind of think when you look at John 17, I want to reach the world. Dean, you want to reach the world, Emily? <laughs> we're going to have to do something that nobody else is doing. You know what nobody else is doing, Michael? Unity. Unity. The unity that is only produced by the gospel. And that's what we're going to see. That heaven's strategy is unity. And as we pull together and love one another, as we care for one another's needs, honestly, as we forgive one another, as you forgive me when I sin or, or make a mistake, that kind of stuff, there is no church leader guru methodology that can compare to a unified church. That's what the world's looking for. And that's what's going to flip our city upside down. Let's pray. Whenever we sit under the word, as James reminds us, uh, we don't just hear the word, but we respond to it. And uh, I think it's highly appropriate for us to respond in a few ways right now. Um, one of them is through prayer. Prayer unites us. Just like Jesus prayed for us, we need to pray for each other. One of the things I'm so grateful for here at Rise is we have a prayer team that uh, seven days a week, they are praying over us when we share big or small things happening. And so I just want to encourage you right now where you're at, whether you're watching this online or with us here right now, uh, that you would just uh, 
share with our prayer team. You can go to rise.cc and at the very bottom, there's a prayer form and just, hey, here's something that's on my heart and on my mind. It's amazing how that can unite you with someone else. And, and maybe during this time of worship, maybe you wanna stop and, and actually take a moment and, and pray, uh, send a text prayer to someone. Encourage them. Take a moment to pray for them while we're singing words of worship to Jesus. It brings them honor and glory when we do that. Another way we worship and respond to the word is, is actually through generosity. When we uh, give to God, it's acknowledging, hey, no matter what is happening, no matter what is going on, you are my rock. You are the one who sustains me. We are stewards of what he has given us. And so we give back to the one who gives all, declaring we love him more than the things of this world and we trust him more the, than the economy and the, the projections. It's an act of worship. And lastly, we worship through singing, through, through raising our voices and raising our hands. And, and, and singing feels a little bit different in this season. But during, when Jesus was walking, the, the Pharisees came and they, they asked him this question about the disciples and, and how they were responding to him and worshiping him and all these different things. And, and he responds, he looks at me, he says, if they don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. Why? Because he is worthy. All of creation sings and glorifies and lifts up praise to him. And so whether you're in a living room right now or, or with us here in this moment tonight, yes, it feels different, but it's not about how we feel. And it's not about the circumstances of the environments we're in. It's about Jesus and what he's done. That's why he's worthy of our worship. And that's why we're going to worship him together.
Stop working, it never stop, it never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. It never stop, it never stop working. It never stop, it never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. It never stop, it never stop working. Stop working, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is, 
that's who you are, Lord. You make a way when we don't see one. When we are blinded, when we can't feel which way to go, you make that way, Lord. And we can trust in you. We know that you prepare the path before us, Lord. And that we simply need to follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, every part of you. Lord, we love you so much. We love you so much. Amen.